Hello, and welcome to week three of Art History 1, uh, Prehistory to Medieval. This is FINA H. 111. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about ancient Egypt and some of the more major art trends to occur during this very long-lived uh, civilization. So without any further delay, let's move on to our first image. So to begin our discussion of ancient Egypt, uh, let's take a quick look at a map and get an idea of where we're situated geographically. And I also have a few dates on screen uh, to give us a sense of the scope of the civilization. Um, ancient Egyptians, there were human settlements along the Nile Valley uh, at least as early as 5000 BCE. Um, anything before about 2920 BCE is what we consider the pre-dynastic era. Uh, the Egyptians who lived in that area in the Nile Valley prior to 2920 were <clears throat> people who were unified more or less by a common language, a similar language, probably common or similar cultural and religious beliefs. Uh, but they were not what we would consider an empire or a single unified uh, dynasty until a little bit later on. After 2920, we get into the early dynastic period, and we'll talk a little bit about how that comes to be. Uh, and then you can see the divisions of the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom dates here on the slide. Um, <clears throat> Cuneiform develops in Mesopotamia, about 2900 BCE to give us a connection to what we discussed last week uh, with Mesopotamia. Uh, we won't get the construction of the pyramids of Giza until after 2500 BCE. Uh, to put that in perspective with what we talked about on the first week, uh, the final phase of construction at Stonehenge uh, begins somewhere about 2100 BCE. Uh, and it's after that, in sort of the last phase of the uh, ancient Egyptian empire, that we'll get the rule of some important pharaohs like Hatshepsut and Akhenaten. Uh, and of course, Tut, whom everyone knows. As we look at this map, you can see the Red Sea, you can see the Mediterranean, uh, and how the Nile moves north uh, along the eastern part of Egypt. Um, We'll be jumping around from different cities up and down uh, Egypt, up and down the Nile here. Uh, you can see this green area on the map roughly correlates to the expanse of the New Kingdom uh, from about 1550 BCE. Um, <clears throat> you're going to notice uh, that Lower Egypt is in the north and Upper Egypt is in the south. That does sometimes confuse students who want to read things. Uh, where north is up. Uh, it has nothing to do with the points on the compass. It has everything to do with altitude. Upper Egypt is physically higher than lower Egypt. Uh, so don't let that confuse you. So with that in mind, now that we have a sense of where we are geographically, let's move on to our first image. So this image here is from the pre-dynastic period of Egyptian history. Um, we'll just take a quick look at a little bit of the iconography that we see here. Uh, we believe that this is a river scene where we see people, boats, animals, um, <clears throat> all of these different figures being painted on a flat surface. Uh, the entire thing is approximately 16 feet long, so it's quite a monumental piece. Now we won't speak too much about any potential symbolism here, but I want you to keep this image in the back of your mind as we look through the dynastic eras uh, of Egyptian art. What we'll notice in this is the placement of the figures and how the artists here are trying to tell a kind of narrative. Take a moment to really look at this. We're going to notice that the figures are very abstract, they're quite flat, but there's not a whole lot of detail within those figures. Uh, we can tell very easily which ones are animals and humans and boats. Uh, there's no problem there, uh, but there's not a lot of detail. And we'll also notice that the organization, the pictorial organization of the piece, is a little bit more haphazard than what we've seen, uh, say, with the Sumerians, 
or uh, with the Assyrians, or some of those uh, civilizations that we looked at last week, where everything was spelled out in very clear registers, very clear bands. In this time period, and we're, again, way back in the pre-dynastic era, around about 3500 BCE, we don't have that rigid structure of convention quite yet. Now, once we move into the dynastic era, what we're going to see is a very rigid set of rules, a very rigid set of conventions on how to organize the pictorial uh, scene, how, how to organize this pictorial space. And that will become the way for Egyptian artists to express these narratives uh, for thousands and thousands of years. What's really remarkable about Egyptian civilization is how long it endured and how very rigid their rules of pictorial representation were within that incredibly long period of time. Um, so keep this image in mind and we'll see how their concepts of representation and the organization of the picture plane uh, really uh, evolved quite radically over centuries. So as I mentioned, what's really fascinating about ancient Egyptian history is that it covers a continuous period of over 3,000 years. To put this into perspective, most modern countries count their histories in hundreds of years. Really only modern China can come anywhere close to this in the terms of historical continuity. Egyptian culture declined and disappeared nearly 2,000 years ago. The last vestiges of the living cr culture that we're looking at ceased to exist uh, at about the year 391 CE when the Byzantine Empire, uh, Emperor uh, Theodosius I closed all pagan temples uh, throughout the Roman Empire. Um, and that's the date we sort of assign to the official end of ancient Egypt, uh, ancient Egyptian culture. It was not until Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798 that the wonderful artifacts of the, of the Egyptians were seen in Europe. 1799, a French captain named Pierre Bouchard uh, discovered the Rosetta Stone, which was carved with the same text in two languages, Egyptian and Greek, and three writing systems, hieroglyphic, demotic, and the Greek alphabet. The man who did more than any other to recover the words of the ancient Egyptians was a uh, French explorer Jean-François uh, Champion. He was an art historian and a brilliant lingu uh, linguist, and by the age of 16 had mastered not only Latin and Greek, but six Asian languages, including Coptic, uh, which was the late form of ancient Egyptian. In the 1820s, Champion established an entire list of Egyptian symbols with their Greek equivalents and was the first Egyptologist to realize that the symbols were not only alphabetic but syllabic and in some cases determinative, meaning that they depicted the meaning of the, world, the word itself. Now this is significant for us as scholars. Um, People knew, of course, that the ancient Egyptians had existed and had some sort of thriving, wonderful civilization. Um, obviously, people could see the pyramids, and they knew that all of this was there. Um, modern scholars, however, did not know what any of it meant, what any of it was about, or really much about the customs of the ancient Egyptians until the late 1700s, early 19th century. That's when we find the Rosetta Stone. That's when we start to figure out how to decipher hieroglyphics. That's when we can actually start reading uh, these images and start understanding the hierarchy. Um, <clears throat> That causes an explosion of information about Egypt in the 19th century, an explosion of interest in ancient Egypt. Uh, ancient Egypt was quite a, a popular topic in 19th century Europe. Uh, it was something everyone was talking about, everyone was interested in. There was a lot of mysticism wrapped up in it as well. So we're not going to get too much into the mystical aspects of Egyptology although it is kind of fun to read about. Um, <clears throat> let's look at this piece. And now that we have the benefit of this knowledge, let's try to figure out what we're looking at here. This is referred to as the Palette of Narmer, and it's one object. We're seeing the front and the back of it in these two shots. 
Uh, this comes right at the cusp of the early dynastic, pre-dynastic era, circa about 3000 BCE. It's carved out of slate, and it's a little over two feet tall, so this is not a small piece. Um, what we're going to notice in this piece, as we look at the left-hand side image, we see a clear representation of hierarchy of scale, which we talked about last week, where we're going to see our major figure is in the center of the composition. He's also physically larger than everybody else. He's wearing sutran, a certain accoutrement of power. He's got a crown. He's got a scepter. Um, and take a moment here to look at what he's doing, the activity he's participating in. Uh, what we're going to notice is that he's standing on a firm ground line. He has another figure on their knees before him. He's grabbed that person by the hair, and then he has his scepter above his head, ready to strike down on that person's head and kill them. Uh, it's a really violent scene. Underneath this ruler's feet, and this is Narmer, by the way, uh, underneath his feet, we see more trampled dead bodies of his enemies. Uh, again, very similar to what we saw in Mesopotamian art last week. It's a very clear description of power and authority. Narmer is the guy we usually associate <clears throat> with the unification of Egypt. Uh, it was through his conquest and his rule that the people of Upper Egypt and the people of Lower Egypt, who had been more or less autonomous, uh, he unified them into the first dynastic era, uh, into sort of Egypt proper, if we want to consider it like that. Lots of other great symbols uh, that you can see in this piece where we see the sort of consolidation of Egyptian symbols. Uh, we have <clears throat> a king as a unifier. We see at the top these uh, bulls. Uh, bulls are representative of the king and the power of the king. You see... Uh, you see a cow in there. The, uh, the cow is representative of the sky goddess. The falcon, of course, is representative of Horus, uh, the god. Uh, very rich and deep uh, symbolic elements. On the right-hand image, this is just the other side of the palette, but on the right-hand image, you see more of the story being uh, uh, spelled out for us. <clears throat> well, notice that, that this image is very clearly organized into registers, a bit more like what we saw with ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, so we have a clear upper register with a ground line. We see a procession uh, over towards the left. Again, the tallest figure in the composition right there, that's our king, that's Narmer. He's wearing uh, a crown of unification. All of his servants, soldiers, uh, banner carriers are, are in front of him. Um, they're carrying these tall poles with these symbolic banners indicating his rule. And on the far right of that register, take a good close look at what we're seeing there. Again, just sort of uh, grotesquely br brutal. Those are the fallen enemies of Narmer. Um, and they are, in fact, dead bodies stacked on top of each other. They've all been decapitated and their heads have are, are been placed between their legs. Now that's just gruesome. Uh, it's just brutal. <clears throat> but it's also extremely important if you think about Egyptian religion. Now we'll get into a little bit more on this later, but I'm sure all of you already know that the ancient Egyptians practiced mummification. They thought that the preservation of the body was really, really important to the preservation of the soul and the ability of one to move on into the afterlife. Keeping that body intact was really important to, to one's soul, to, one's, uh, to the immortality of one's soul. To take the head off of a person was to desecrate the body, was to mutilate the body, and by virtue of that, to mutilate the soul. Uh, to, to make it so the soul itself could not find rest, could not find safe passage to the afterworld. So that's, that's a, an extremely important symbol that the king is displaying here. Um, he's not just waging a war on people's bodies. He's waging a war on people's immortal souls. Uh, so this is an, an extremely important insult that he has done to these fallen victims in his war. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so now that we've had a chance to look at this, and your book will have a little bit more detail, 
excuse me. Uh, let's move on and take a look at some of the architecture that's also developing during this early dynastic period. So as I mentioned, the funerary practices of the ancient Egyptians are quite fascinating and they all revolve around the belief that the body, excuse me, the soul needs the support of the body in the afterlife. Um, the Egyptians, we, if we want to use modern terms to sort of think about this, in our modern culture we often use the, the saying, you can't take it with you. So we have this idea that when you die, all of the worldly possessions that we have around us and that we enjoy, you can't take it with you. It doesn't mean anything after death. Well, the Egyptians had a very radically different concept of the afterlife. Um, you can take it with you. You do take it with you. And you had better take it with you. Um, your soul depends on you taking it with you. So what does that mean in practice? It means that we need to preserve the body so that the soul... Um, which uh, the Egyptians referred to as the Ka, uh, so that the soul had a, a point of reference, had a physical manifestation that it could draw upon in the afterlife. It also means that we need complex funeral rituals, whereby we read from the Book of the Dead, which is sort of a, uh, it's a guidebook on how to get to the afterlife. It gives instructions to the soul on how to proceed once you find yourself dead. Um, and it also means that we need a repository for all of the things that our soul is going to need in the afterlife. This makes for really, really complex funerary customs and funerary uh, buildings, architecture. So early on in the dynastic era, uh, what we'll see is mummification becomes more and more codified. It's something that Egyptians were practicing for, for many, many generations before we had dynasties. And they would probably do these mummifications uh, very naturally out in the desert, burying the dead and drying them out uh, through natural means in the desert. As the culture gets more sophisticated, this becomes more regimented and becomes more ritualized. And then we start to develop these uh, burial places specifically for the body and everything that it's going to need in the afterlife. So what we're looking at here are some artist renderings of what was a typical early uh, burial place called a mastaba. You could think of a mastaba uh, as sort of the only the very base layer of a pyramid. <clears throat> As you can see by these diagrams, it was mostly entirely uh, brick construction. Most of it was solid. There was very little in terms of interior space or interior rooms. There would be some sort of subterranean burial chamber, uh, and then a ritual space, and a space for housing any sort of artifacts or things that a person would need to take with them in the afterlife. Um, <clears throat> so we see this in the early era. And this worked out pretty well for most Egyptians. If you had any sort of money, any sort of social standing, you probably had a mastaba. Uh, if you were a pharaoh, if you were the king, uh, you had something a little bit bigger, a little bit better. And we'll talk about the advancements of that as we go. Uh, but these are big, permanent structures. And that's exactly how they're intended to be. You could think of them, they're, they're very similar to the ziggurats that we looked at last week. Uh, the difference, of course, being that this is an actual burial place and there would be no temple sitting on top of it like there would with the uh, ziggurats. But let's take a look at the advancement of this architecture from the mastaba to the next phase of construction, the step pyramid. So we begin with the mastaba as a monument, a funerary monument. Uh, and let's look how, within a few centuries, the Egyptians are able to uh, make some pretty big advances in their, in their engineering technology. Uh, and we can trace a lot of this back to one architect named Imhotep. Uh, Imhotep was an architect. He worked for the pharaoh. Uh, and he's the one we uh, believe is responsible for this innovation that we're looking at here, a stepped pyramid. 
Now, I want you to take a good look at this. Now, it's obviously been eroded, uh, and parts of it have been damaged over, you know, the thousands of years that it's been standing. Uh, but it's still in decent shape, given its age. And I want you to point your attention on the far left-hand side, sort of in the lower part. You can see a big group of tourists, a big group of people over there. And then you see some more way over on the right-hand side of, of the photograph. And I just want you to... to realize how big that pyramid is. Um, all of these objects are just incredibly immense. As big as you think they are, they're bigger. Um, <clears throat> they're mind-blowingly big. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Um, <clears throat> so what did, what did Imhotep do that was so remarkable? Egyptians were already making mastaba. Now Imhotep worked for the pharaoh Djoser. Uh, Djoser, being the pharaoh, needed to have a really splendid, spectacular burial ground. Uh, the amount of money and the amount of um, complexity that your funeral ritual had was directly related to your station in life within Egyptian society. If you were a, a poor laborer, farmer, uh, somebody not of any sort of noble uh, or royal status, your funerary tradition was quite modest. You were still mummified. You still probably had a small family mastaba or burial area that was communal for the members of your family. And you still went through those steps to preserve the body uh, and perform those rituals. If you were uh, somebody of a higher class, more money. You had uh, a singular mastaba, perhaps just for you. Um, you had uh, a lot more ritual associated with your funeral, a lot more items being preserved in your tomb. Uh, things just got stepped up. If you were the pharaoh, you were God. And the Egyptians very much held this belief that the pharaoh was a god manifest on earth. He was the personification of the gods, so that was very, very important. He's not just a symbol of gods, he is the god. Um, <clears throat> when a god changes form from the earthly realm and goes through this metamorphosis to go into the afterlife uh, to continue his rule, you need a really spectacular burial to honor that king, to honor that god. Uh, Djoser realized this and confided in Imhotep, his architect, and Imhotep was able to figure out how to do something like this. On the surface, a step pyramid seems rather simple. It's basically a series of mastaba stacked on top of each other. So you can see that in this image. Uh, on the very lower level, you can just see what looks like a large mastaba. And then on top of that, like a tier of a wedding cake, is another big mastaba, and so on, up and up and up. In terms of practicality, however, this is immensely complex, extremely difficult. Uh, to imagine how this was created um, and just the sheer engineering genius of this. Once we have Emotep able to figure out the math, able to figure out the engineering on how to build at the scale uh, and how to build on this sort of level of complexity, able to figure out how to organize the workforce and everything that goes into that, this really blows the doors open uh, in terms of monumental architecture uh, for the ancient Egyptians and for other cultures, as I'll talk about a little bit later on. But what's important also about the Step Pyramid here, this wasn't just a singular building built out in the middle of the desert. As we'll see in the next slide, there was a lot more to this complex than just this piece. So what we're seeing here are a couple of artist renderings of what the entire plan and Saqqara would have looked like, the entire mortuary precinct of Djoser. And that's a good way to think of these. This was a mortuary precinct. It was a huge section of the city dedicated entirely uh, to the funeral complex of our pharaoh, of Djoser. Uh, you can see it's pretty complex in the upper left-hand image. Uh, all of the different places are, are numbered where you can actually see where the pyramid itself is, uh, sort of in the center. There are courtyards, there are small temples, uh, there's uh, other little court areas, the royal tomb, 
uh, storage areas. It's a very complex system. How these would have been used, and this is going to be true of this place and also the other funeral complexes, the pyramids of Giza, uh, all the other funeral complexes we're going to be looking at today. Um, these began to construction before the pharaoh died because it would take many, many decades to construct. Uh, huge amounts of, of labor, workforce, and materials going into it. Basically, if you were a pharaoh, you began planning your funeral practically on the day you were born. Uh, you had to begin planning and building and constructing uh, your funeral complex at an extremely early age. Um, it was an extremely important part of who you were was planning for your death, which of course sounds really incredibly morbid to us today, but it was simply a way of life and simply how things were done at this time. Um, the continuity of the soul from one life to another, from the, the earthly realm to the afterlife, was an extremely important part of Egyptian life. Not in an abstract way, in a very concrete way. You were concerned about the state of your soul, and you wanted to make sure that it could make that passage uh, as smoothly and easily as possible. And again, that's just magnified exponentially for our Pharaoh, who is himself considered a god on earth. So as we look at this complex, um, we can see where the Pharaoh would have been buried. We can see tombs set out for his family. We see lots of storage magazines, and this is where things like food uh, and wine and artifacts would be placed in storage. Uh, this is all very, very important as uh, your soul, your ka, once the body dies, uh, your soul goes through a, a set uh, standard of rituals spelled out in the, um, the Book of the Dead. You go through a period of judgment where the gods, Osiris and Horus and so on, judge your soul, determine whether or not you can pass on into the underworld, into the afterlife. If they deem you worthy of that honor, um, <clears throat> you have to be able to support yourself. You need, a, you need your body um, to be sort of reanimated in a way in the afterlife. All of the things that you need to have in this world water, wine, food, clothing, um, all of those things that you need in this world, you also need in the afterlife. Uh, it's a very odd sort of continuity of existence in the afterlife. Whatever your role is in on the earthly realm, whether you're a farmer or um, a builder or a pharaoh or what have you, that's going to be your role in the afterlife. And so you need all of the things that you need in this realm, you need it in the next realm. It's a very interesting idea of continuity uh, of the soul. Um, for the pharaoh, that meant you need these big structures. And these would remain active long after the pharaoh died. There are temples here. There would be priests uh, and clergy and uh, holy figures who would live in this space, who would perform rituals in this space, all to honor the god pharaoh. Uh, and the pharaoh's very soul depended on that continuity, on the idea that people would be continually making offerings, continually giving prayers, and doing all of these things in his name here. Um, very, very complex. Uh, and it's also showing us, even at this relatively early stage in the Egyptian empire, the sheer amount of resources at their disposal. Uh, as we look at the amount of, of money and resources and manpower uh, in order to create these massive building projects and still thrive as a culture, still expand militarily uh, and, and culturally and economically. Um, this is some incredibly sophisticated uh, social political uh, achievements that they're able to do here. Um, as I mentioned last week, Egypt, like all of these cultures, do not exist in a bubble. They're interacting with each other. There's lots of trade, lots of negotiation, military conquests, and so on, going on between what we consider the ancient Near East, the Mesopotamian cultures, uh, between the Egyptians and the Greeks. There's going to be a lot of cross-cultural communication there. Um, and they're sort of using each other, building off of each other, communicating with each other. Um, and particularly the Greek-Egyptian uh, connection is very interesting. We'll talk a bit about when we get up to mainland Greece.
So let's move on to the next big step in funeral architecture. This is what most people think about when they think about ancient Egypt, uh, the Great Pyramid at Giza. Um, <clears throat> here we see them in a nice panoramic shot looking out across the desert. Uh, there are three pyramids, of course. They're all a little bit different sizes. Uh, we have the Pyramid of Menkara, Khafra, and Khufu. Uh, there's a little bit of controversy over which one belongs to which uh, pharaoh. Um, yeah, well, there's a little bit of debate. We'll get into some of that. Um, but this is obviously just the most spectacular thing. Uh, that we can associate with ancient Egypt, and for good reason. You see a couple, uh, two or three step pyramids in the foreground to give us, again, just sort of a sense of scale. We often think about the pyramids of Giza like they're just sort of out in the middle of nowhere and that they have nothing else going on around them. These were a part of a very, very large uh, funerary complex, much like the funeral complex of Djoser we just looked at. Uh, as big as Djoser's complex was, of course, this complex is much, much larger. Um, the pyramids themselves, of course, are much, much larger. Um, they're really outstanding pieces of construction. We can very much uh, give credit to Imhotep uh, and his ideas that allowed us to extrapolate and sort of take this next step uh, to the pure pyramids that we see here. Um, <clears throat> now, I mentioned there was a little bit of, of controversy about which pyramid belongs to whom. Uh, the major consensus right now is that the largest pyramid uh, belongs to Khufu. So that is the funeral complex of Khufu. It is 13 acres at the base. So try to just wrap your mind around that for a second. Uh, 13 acres uh, at the base of, of that pyramid. Uh, it's approximately 450 feet tall. Um, we know that Khafra's is probably the middle-sized, and then we believe Menkara's is the smallest. Um, as I said, there's still a little bit of controversy, but that's the prevailing theory right now. Um, <clears throat> let's take another look at these pyramids from a different angle. So here are the th same three pyramids, but taken from a different angle, sort of on the other side of them. Um, again, trying to give you a sense of the scale of these things. It's, it's actually rather difficult to do uh, with the pyramids because where they're situated now is in a protected area of land um, just outside the modern day city of Cairo. And in this image, if you look past the pyramids into the background, you can just make out the modern day city of Cairo uh, in the background there. Uh, it's not far at all from the major, bustling, incredibly crowded city of Cairo. Um, but where they're located is a protected area, and there's really nothing else immediately around the pyramids except for desert, uh, which is wonderfully evocative and makes for a very great experience to go there. Uh, but it's really hard to take a good photograph that gets you a sense of scale. Um, so as I said, the largest pyramid, 450 feet tall, 13 acres at the base. You can make out in this image, and I'll show you some closer images in a second, uh, that these are made out of very large bricks uh, that have been stacked on top of each other. Now when I say bricks, um, one of those bricks is bigger than your car. Uh, it weighs several tons. Uh, it's going to be approximately five feet or so tall uh, 10 to 12 feet long. So that's one brick. And there could be millions of bricks in one of these pyramids. It's mind-boggling, uh, the construction of these pieces. Um, they're very precisely laid out. We're not just erecting these wherever we feel like it. Uh, the architects who placed these took a lot of time to consider exactly how they would be placed. Um, the entrance was on the north face of the pyramid. Each pyramid had its own walled complex, which was important. Uh, the east-west axis was allied with the sun, so that the sun would rise and set over the appropriate faces of the pyramids. These originally had a smooth limestone finish. So this is not how the ancient architects would have wanted us to see these. Uh, so you kind of have to use your imagination here. 
uh, that brick would have been covered with a smooth face of white limestone, which would have come together at a crisp uh, cutting edge on the corners of each of those pyramids. Absolutely smooth white finish going all the way to the very top of the pyramid. The very top point of the pyramid would have been capped in gold. So just imagine that for a minute. The sun rising over the desert, those orange-red rays of the early morning sun coming across the desert sand, hitting that white limestone full on the face, on the, uh, uh, on the eastern face, hitting that golden cap. You would have seen these things for miles and miles away. Think about the light that would have reflected off of these. They would have been beacons in the desert. And that was absolutely a part of the effect. These are, this is a part of the spectacle of the funerary ritual. Remember, our pharaohs are gods on earth. And so we want to have a funeral space, commemorative spaces that are going to evoke that idea of otherworldliness, of godlike power and might. And these most certainly would have fit the bill once they were uh, finished constructed. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So they're amazing pieces. I do want to show you a couple more uh, images that are a little bit closer so we can see a little bit better some of the construction. So here's a couple of other images. Again, just to give you a sense of what these things look like from different angles, different lighting conditions. Um, as I said, um, modern day Egypt, uh, these are very well preserved. Uh, this entire area is a part of a, a protected national park uh, that they control who can come in and come out. Uh, really incredible pieces. <clears throat> so again, you, can, you just have to use your imagination to try to figure out, try to imagine what these looked like with that smooth limestone finish on them. Uh, they were absolutely amazing. They were known as one of the, the wonders of the ancient world. Uh, you could think of them in a way, just like they're tourist attractions now. People flock from all over the world to go to Cairo to see these. Um, they were tourist attractions in the ancient world. Word got out about these things. And people from all over the known world came to Egypt, came to Giza to see these things. Uh, this type of architecture, this monumental architecture, will have a profound effect on the ancient Greeks. Uh, in a couple of weeks when we start looking at Greek classical architecture, one of the main reasons that the Greeks are able to take the leap to building their own monumental temples and massive pieces of architecture is because they're aware of what the Egyptians are doing. The Egyptians do it first. They build their monumental pieces first. And the Greeks figure out many of the techniques and the skills that they need for their own work, they learn it by studying what the Egyptians have done. Uh, so there's a lot of cross-cultural uh, communication between these cultures. Um, let's take a look at a schematic of what's going on inside of one of these pyramids. Here's a diagram uh, of what the interior structure of Khufu's pyramid looks like. Um, and as you can see, and again, 13 acres at the base, 450 feet tall, the vast majority of that is solid brick. Um, there are interior passageways and rooms, but the vast majority is solid brick. Um, <clears throat> really incredible once you think about it. Not only are there interior spaces within the pyramid itself, as you can see, right in the center of the pyramid, uh, but there are also subterranean tunnels that go on underneath that. Um, there are a variety of different air shafts and false temp, uh, excuse me, false tunnels. Uh, there are booby traps in there. Uh, there are different chambers, burial chambers, all again for the perpetuation of the pharaoh's soul, of his ka, into the afterlife. Um, <clears throat> You're going to notice number two on this diagram are thieves' tunnels. Now, one of the reasons that these funerary complexes are, also, are so complex uh, and that there's so much going on with them uh, and there are so many walls and entrances and chambers, uh, one, it's important to the actual funeral ritual of moving the soul from one phase of life to another in the afterlife. 
but it's also for a bit more practical reason um, thieves these temples these burial sites especially the ones belonging to the pharaohs are filled with some of the most beautiful and precious uh, artifacts you could imagine solid gold figurines precious stones um, it's absolutely filled with all of this wealth and precious material um, people wanted to steal it to say it quite frankly uh, in fact even in ancient times these these complexes were being robbed from uh, people were trying to break in trying to get to the gold to the precious stones uh, this was an immensely dangerous crime to participate in um, if you were somebody who was trying to break into the Pharaoh's tomb to steal some of his riches uh, if you got caught that was the end of you uh, they did not take kindly to that as you might imagine this is also where many of the myths of the mummy come in uh, people who break into the tomb might be cursed or something like that that those legends do date back to ancient Egypt uh, the idea that these were sacred places sacred holy ground um, and if you try to defile that you could be cursed uh, you could be you could seek uh, you would you would get the uh, the vengeance of the gods upon your head and you don't want the vengeance of the gods upon your head so many of the legends of the the mummy's tomb mummy's curse do actually date back to ancient Egypt themselves although they've certainly been greatly expanded upon by Hollywood um, <clears throat> but thievery was a problem just as soon as these temples these burial mounds get sealed up after the funeral ritual is over almost immediately people are trying to break into them um, an unfortunate side effect of that is that we as modern day scholars we don't get a lot of information out of these tombs the wall carvings and paintings are still there in many cases the mummies themselves are still there um, but much of the artifacts the smaller objects the precious objects have been looted uh, over again thousands of years um, which is unfortunate and we'll talk a bit about the repercussions of this towards the end of this presentation when we talk about King Tut uh, because Tutankhamun was a very unusual pharaoh uh, when it comes to his tomb and what we're able to find there um, <clears throat> but yes there'll be more information in your book about some of the specific details of how these were constructed some of that is still a mystery a lot of speculation on how they're actually able to move this amount of material um, <clears throat> But as I said, it's not just the pyramids themselves. It's an entire complex. So let's take a look at the overall complex where the pyramids of Giza are located. Here we're looking at a model of the complex at Giza where you can see where the pyramids are in relationship to one another. Uh, their overall temple complexes. Uh, the passageways to their main entrance and of course you have the Sphinx which we haven't looked at yet we'll take a closer look at in a second um, <clears throat> excuse me so you can see where they're in alignment towards each other and how they connect up to the river uh, that's very important to how we believe these were constructed uh, we believe that most of the rock and brick and material that was required for uh, the pyramids was quarried excavated elsewhere and then brought to the construction site on barges unloaded and then moved to uh, where it was assembled uh, you're talking thousands of laborers millions and millions of hours of, of, of manpower uh, going into this um, <clears throat> so I had already mentioned last week when we talked about ancient Mesopotamia uh, things like uh, the the wall around Babylon and so on these massive building projects what that means practically for the society that creates them um, the manpower the the surplus of supplies that you need to support that manpower all of that applies here uh, everything that was needed in ancient Babylon to build the Ishtar gate and the massive wall um, we need all of that and maybe more here uh, in Egypt to create these pyramids and these funeral complexes uh, so keep that in mind that the mere fact that these exist already indicates to us so much about the hierarchy and scale and complexity of this society. 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we see the funeral complexes here, very much like the Step Pyramid with Djoser. Uh These are inhabited spaces long after our pharaohs are dead and interred. Uh, these are still active spaces. Offerings are being made. Clergy priests are, are using these areas. And that's important um, to keeping the site active and keeping the pharaoh's ka, their soul, uh, happy and prosperous in the afterlife. Um, so now let's move on to that curious little figure here uh, of the Sphinx. So here are a couple of different images of the Great Sphinx. Uh, the one in the upper left, you can see the Pyramid of Khafra in the background. Uh, so as you saw in the previous image, this is located within the same complex at Giza. Uh, there's a lot, great deal of speculation on whose face that is on the Sphinx. Some have suggested Khafra, others say that it was Khufu. Uh, still a little bit of debate over who that is. Let's talk a bit about the shape of this creature. Uh, Sphinx was very common, uh, commonly associated with the pharaoh. Uh, a bit like the Lamassu that we saw in last week's lecture, the Sphinx was a mythical creature that embodied the supernatural aspects of the leader. So again, our pharaoh is a god on earth. Uh, much like the kings of Assyria, uh, the pharaohs were believed to have supernatural godlike powers. Uh, they, they could see anywhere, they could know anything, they could uh, possibly even change form uh, or inhabit animals. And so these, this idea of using the sphinx, this lion-shaped body with the human head, uh, was another way to try to communicate the supernatural power of the pharaoh to the people around them. So we see these representations quite quite frequently. Uh, very often a smaller scale, this is uh, quite a monumental scale to see it. Um, the Sphinx sits right in front of uh, Khufu's pyramid. That's why we generally tend to think this is, this is probably Khufu um, as the Sphinx. You're going to notice in these images I have, there's been a great deal of erosion, uh, a great deal of uh, weather blasting on the Sphinx here. Um, he's made out of uh, soft materials, local materials, and he hasn't aged well. Um, in the lower right hand image you can see a bit more of his face and the crown that he's wearing. You can see that his nose is not really intact anymore. Obviously all of that was a part of the original piece. Um, he's about 65 feet high, 240 feet long. So again, monumental. Uh, the pharaohs at this time did not do anything a little bit. They went all out for it. Um, <clears throat> some of the damage we see on the face of the Sphinx is of course due to centuries of weathering. Uh, some other damage, like the uh, missing nose, can be attributed to uh, invading armies, particularly, particularly uh, Napoleon's army. When Napoleon invaded uh, Egypt in the 1800s, uh, they found the Sphinx out here in the desert, and most of it had been covered up by sand at that point, but the head, a part of the face, was still sticking out of the sand. Uh, by all accounts, many of the French soldiers thought well, that was a great thing to do target practice with, and they would line up and just take hot shots at the Sphinx. Uh, and that's where we attribute a lot of the damage being done to the nose. So, kind of unfortunate there. Um, <clears throat> but definitely an interesting part of the history of this amazing piece. Here are a couple more images uh, to try to, again to give us a sense of where the Sphinx is located in relationship to the pyramids. Uh, this is, as I mentioned before, uh, a modern day tourist site. You see lots of tourists in this image trying to get shots of the Sphinx and the pyramid and uh, the overall area. And in the lower right you see uh, another image of the Sphinx in front of the pyramid. And yeah, that woman in the green shirt, that's me. I was there a few years ago. Um, yeah, that's a, to give you a sense of scale, sure, we'll say that. Um, <clears throat> but you can see that the Sphinx, as big as it is, 200 and 40 feet long, 65 feet tall, looks absolutely tiny in front of that massive, massive pyramid. Uh, the 
the overwhelming scale of this monumental architecture is, is just amazing. Uh, the Sphinx is several hundred feet away from the pyramid. And if you were approaching towards where the main entrance would have been, where in ancient times you would have approached these pyramids, um, that Sphinx would have been the first thing that would have greeted you. You would have had to have gone past the Sphinx into the funeral complex before you could approach the pyramids themselves. Uh, so it's an absolutely mind-blowing sort of experience.